Twenty years ago, companies such as Shell Canada and Gulf Canada came to Tuktoyaktuk to begin exploration for oil and gas. Now, as the world's reserves are dwindling, the companies and many more have returned to the north in the hopes of finding resources to provide for the future. Fort Mopta, I'm Marjorie Bates. My name is Jim Guthrie and I'm the president of Arctic Oil and Gas Services Incorporated. And Arctic Oil and Gas is a company that was uh, incorporated in June of 2000 and is a 100% Inuvialuit company, half owned by the Inuvialuit Development Corporation and half owned by E-Group and Transport from Tuktoyaktuk. Okay. Um, is Swimming, Swimming Point the main camp for Arctic Oil and Gas or do you have other camps set up? Well, certainly Swimming Point is the biggest operation that Arctic Oil and Gas has. Uh, Petro-Canada approached uh, Arctic Oil and Gas in June to put together a, uh, uh, a bid and a proposal for uh, building a camp and then for managing the camp for them over a four-year period. And we did that and we were the successful uh, bidder and were awarded uh, that job and, uh, and, and uh, what we did, uh, ESSO had a big base camp in Tuktoyaktuk that had been uh, sitting idle for five or six years. And so we uh, dismantled that camp and moved it by barge down to Swimming Point, rebuilt the camp, and then the rest of the facilities are new, like the tank farm and uh, a, big, uh, where, a big garage. And uh, we completed all that work by uh, late October into November and moved in and that's where Petro Canada uh, manages their uh, operations in the Mackenzie Delta from Swimming Point. Okay. Um, how, how big the camp is Swimming Point, like population wise? There's about 50 people uh, working out of there right, right today. Mm -hmm. It was as high as 90 and, and that's kind of the way of a, of a base camp at different times of the year when uh, seismic operations or drilling operations are being mobilized, a lot of that is done from the base camp. So uh, uh, at the time of the drilling rig was being moved to its site and, and, so, and the workers there didn't have anywhere to stay, then they stayed at Swimming Point and it went up to 90 people. But once the drilling rig was in place and its camp was running, then those, you know, those people moved over to the other, the other camp. And, and that's... Uh, one of the purposes of a base camp is to supply all the logistical support that uh, Petro Canada would need f for their drilling rigs and for their seismic operations. Okay, how far is your drilling rig from uh, the The Kirk M15 well is what what uh, is the drilling location, and uh, the uh, Kita Equitac is the contractor that's drilling that well. And it's 45 kilometers from Swimming Point, almost straight west uh, as the crow flies. By the road, you have to kind of go south around Barsi and then a little bit north again. And is the Akita rig, the drill rig, up and running, or is it? Still yes. They, the, ter the term of the drilling business is when they start to drill, they call it spudding the well. And uh, they expect to do that tomorrow. But the derrick's up, uh, everything's there. Everything's working, the camp's up, and they probably have 60 people there right now, and they'll start to drill tomorrow morning. And uh, I think they have a 45-day drilling program, and then some. And then they always, at the end of the, you know, when you get to the drilling target, uh, then there's a period of time when they test the well, and that can be, uh, you know, a different length of time. It's probably about a two-week period, and then at that time, then they would dismantle the drilling rig and in all likelihood move it completely back to Swimming Point and store it then through the summer and uh, do some work on it over the summer and then get it ready for next, next year's operation at some other drilling location.
Is uh, Swimming Point going to be up and running all year long or just during the winter months? That decision hasn't been made yet. Uh, after April 30th, when uh, you no longer can travel on the tundra or on the ice roads, most of this exploration activity uh, ceases at that time. And it's not, the decision has not been made whether Swimming Point will stay open. It, it could be closed for a short period of time, but, I, but it will be open in the summer for some activities, like barges will start to arrive with, uh, with fuel and drill pipe and drill casing and, and the different cements and chemicals you have to use to drill with. So there will have to be people to unload that. Uh, it is possible that uh, Petro Canada might decide to increase the amount of fuel storage they have there. And if they do, then there would be a small construction activity take place. So, so we're not sure uh, that it'll be open 365 days a year, but it'll certainly be open, uh, you know, for for probably eight months of the year. Okay. How did you come about getting this job? And tell me about the, about your your life cycle with the oil and gas industry. Sure. I uh, first came to Anuvik in 1974 as a manager for Gulf Canada Resources. And it, it's kind of an interesting coincidence. Uh, my job at that time was manager of the Swimming Point Base Camp. Uh, Gulf uh, had built the base camp in 1972, and they had four drilling rigs working out of there. And those drilling, were, drilling rigs drilled all over, you know, the Parsons Lake area, all over Richards Island, right up until 1977. And then, of course, when the Berger decision was made for a 10-year moratorium in the pipeline, uh, Gulf and all the other people drilling on land uh, moved uh, moved their camps uh, out and moved all their equipment out and shut those operations down. I uh, I came back north to Tuktoyaktuk in 1980, and then for the decade of the 80s, I was uh, a senior manager of Gulf's uh, at uh, Bo the Bowdrill base in Tuktoyaktuk and managed all the logistical support to all the offshore drilling that took place. And of course, as you know, that all shut down in the 1990s as well because the oil price just did not uh, justify continued exploration for oil in the, in the Beaufort Sea. And uh, in, the, in the 10 years since then, I worked uh, in, in, uh, overseas on some international assignments in Russia, the Philippines, and Kazakhstan. And I'd just come back to Canada uh, a year ago and uh, was contacted by the uh, IRC and IDC, and they explained to me that they expected activity to uh, uh, exploration activity to uh, r really increase this year, and that they wanted to set up a, a company that uh, would have the management ability and the financial ability to take on some some of the bigger projects with the oil companies. And uh, so I came up and uh, had uh, some interviews with. Uh, IDC and accepted the job as president. And so the, the coincidence part, the interesting part, was the very first big job that I was faced with was putting together a bid for this same base camp that I'd originally come here 26 years ago to run. And uh, we did put it together and we got it. And uh, and, uh, and and then uh, for further coincidence, uh, one of the first base managers I hired to run that is named Bruce Alexander. And Bruce also. Uh, was here 25 years ago and ran that, that camp. In fact, uh, we've been able to encourage about six uh, of our senior staff, our people that worked here in the 70s on, on, on land operations and worked here again all through the 80s in offshore drilling operations. They all uh, love working in the Arctic and uh, they, they were all excited to come back and, uh, and they're helping us run this company. Now, uh, I, I think I should take some time just to explain uh, the uh, goals and objectives Article and Gas has work-wise. Uh, what IDC and uh, eGruvens Transport envisioned when they set this company up was a company that would be able to uh, bid on some of these base camp operations that would be coming up and, uh, and be able to uh, build them and to manage them. And of course we've been successful at Swimming Point. And then also to have a company that could uh, offer catering services, and we uh, we've been very fortunate. We are catering for every camp that's out there this year, which is a total of nine. 
And that's where most of our Inuvialuit employees, like the high number of Inuvialuit employees, are working in catering. I think we have about 50 uh, Inuvialuit employees engaged in catering operations right across the, the delta on, uh, on everybody's project. We also supply uh, medical services. Uh, we have a contract with uh, Park Ambulance, and, uh, and next year we'll have a joint venture with them to uh, supply medics at all these locations. And uh, we also are doing some project management. And uh, for example, with Petro Canada, we manage the 40 pieces of equipment that they have on contract. We uh, assist them with that. That goes through us. And we we have a lot of experience in ice road construction. Uh, the building of a drilling lease, the cleaning up of a drilling lease, and that kind of work. And so that's that's uh, that's our mandate. We've we've had a successful first year, and uh, we're quite uh, you know we're quite proud of uh, the work we have been able to get, and quite proud of the uh, high number of uh, New Vialuit Northern employees that we have working for us at this time. How has the um, exploration? oil and gas exploration business changed in the last 26 years? Well, it's changed for sure. I think uh, uh, we're all a lot better at it. Uh, a lot of the technologies have changed in that uh, the oil companies have done a lot of work finding more environmentally friendly ways to drill. For example, 25 years ago, uh, they had to uh, dig uh, fairly large sumps, open sumps, to contain the drilling fluids they had to use the drill with. However, there's been lots of advances in that technology where they use centrifuges and different things so that, so that really, at the end of the well, it's just the cuttings from the hole itself and a little bit of drilling mud that they have to dispose of rather than huge volumes of water. And so the sumps are... Uh, Oh, reduced to probably by 75% to something much smaller, much easier to contain and to bury and to, so that it doesn't become a problem in the future. Uh, they drill quicker, and so uh, that hopefully will allow them to drill more wells in, in a shorter period of time and reduce the cost, because the cost of drilling in the Arctic when you can't drill or you can't move around in the summer are really high compared to other places, you know, where you can drill through the summer quite easily. Uh, so there's changes there, and, and I think there's, I think there's a, a, a much better <clears throat> attempt and a much better understanding of the requirement to absolutely maximize the amount of people from here that are employed, the amount of businesses that are used here. And, 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 of course, part of that is, you know, part of that is also driven by the cooperation agreements that the oil companies sign with the new Alamut. So all those forces together, though, mean uh, uh, much better opportunities for northerners for training and for business and for jobs than there were in the past. Um, I heard uh, through the Great Plains, so to speak, that, that the Akita Ikutak drilling rig was specifically made for Akita? Oh, yes. Can you explain that? Yes, for sure. Uh, you're mentioning the Akita Equitac drilling rig. And by the way, like, the, you know, the, so this is a brand new rig that was constructed and brought up here uh, um, on, on road. It uh, didn't get built in time to bring it by barge. Uh, so it had just arrived and, uh, into Anuvik in uh, December and January and, and out to the location now. And Akita is building three more drilling rigs, but all of them are specially built and specially designed for Arctic conditions. Uh, I don't know the, all the specifics of that because I'm not a driller myself, but I mean, just one of them is for the, the cold weather. Like, even though it's been a mild year, nevertheless, it's still pretty cold for the people that are working on that drilling floor. And so the rigs are well, uh, well insulated, well designed for where the, where the men and women are working so that they're out of the you know, out of the bad weather. Can you tell us your name, uh, your job title here, and who you work for, where you're from? Okay, my name is Bruce Alexander. My position here is base manager of the Swing Point uh, Support Base for Petro Canada. And I've been in the Arctic for quite a number of years. I originally came here in 1972 and uh, worked for Gulf for 20 years in the Delta here as well and in the, in the northern part of the Tuck Base. 
and then we went uh, international for a number of years, and then I came back, and I'm now working for Arctic Oil and Gas in this current position. So you came full circle. Full circle, yeah. I started with golf right at this base, and I'm back here 26 years later, so. So what are some of your responsibilities? Did, did you mention that already? No, I haven't. Uh, in this position, uh, we manage the logistical base for Petrocanada, which is the client. So we look after uh, housing and support facilities on the base. Uh, provide, uh, they have their own aircraft, we provide support for the aircraft facility, uh, trucks, uh, labor crews, things like that, to support their drilling activities. We look after all the catering for this camp as well as other camps in the Delta. And this position is on a four and four rotation. I'm here four weeks, and then the cross shift, Cody Seabrook is here for the for other four weeks. So it's manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Equitoc Drilling, uh, we've been in partnership with the Inuvaluit Development Corporation since 1983, and so we have a very long-standing relationship with this region. And uh, we were very pleased that Petro-Canada came to us and asked if we could work with them to design a purpose-built rig for the Arctic, and as Kathy said, be the first uh, new exploratory rig in this region in 10 years. And, and that, that all occurred kind of through the summer, uh, working with uh, Bruce Berry and Bill Roski and their team of people in Calgary. Uh, we, we put an engineering plan together and, and then began construction of this rig in, in our facility in Nisku. Uh, with a purpose-built rig, there was a few things that uh, were important, particularly to Petro Canada and Anderson, and that was that the, lo the heaviest load be no heavier than 75,000 pounds so that we could move on relatively thin ice and get an early start to the season. And uh, another criteria is that we could rig up this rig without cranes, uh, that there would be a waste heat recovery system to try and conserve as much fuel and, and uh, look after the environment, as Nelly said, uh, as primary in, in all of our operations. And also safety plays a huge role in our business and so modern safety uh, pipe handling equipment, top drive systems that you'll see today were incorporated onto this rig that were never uh, on Arctic rigs before. And so with the design in hand, we, we started to build the rig and it was finished in early December and uh, at a final cost of rig and camp of $16 million. And we built a 60-man camp as well. And a uh, total of rig and camp is 100 loads. And that was trucked up the Dempster Highway into Inuvik and, and racked on the east side of town until we had enough ice to be able to move out to the Kirk location. The rig moved in early February, uh, sputtered its the first well in, uh, I think it was February 9th, and has been drilling safely uh, and without problem ever since. Um, what's significant, and, I, and some of you heard me say this this morning, <coughs> is that we're in the process of building three more rigs, very similar to this, purpose-built Arctic rigs that will come up here this summer by barge uh, to the various staging areas in the Delta for work next winter. Uh, I estimate that there will probably be some 1,500 truckloads of rig that will, uh, or of rig equipment and drilling related equipment like mud, cement products and tubulars that will be brought to Hay River and then barged down to the Nuvik region and to the staging areas come August and September this year. And so I guess if, if you think it's busy this winter, just wait till next year. And uh, I think it's been good for industry and, and good for the communities here to, and then the region to be able to have uh, some seismic programs and one drilling program to kind of kick off uh, the return of the, particularly the natural gas industry to the Arctic. I want to acknowledge all the people who are here. They all come from various um, uh, areas of uh, responsibility and I want to tell you that this was not done by one person alone or one organization alone. One of the things that we had to be sure is that the people, the Inuvialuit themselves, wanted and wanted to support the um, oil and gas exploration once again. So we had to do a lot of work to to go over what were the terms and conditions that were going to be 
inherent in any operation that was going to happen in the Inuvialuit settlement region. So there were many meetings and many people put many, many hours in making those determinations. And as a result, the comfort level at a certain point was inherent in the uh, cooperation and concession agreements that were signed with each and every um, uh, operator. And uh, we still have to continually implement uh, the agreements that we have got. And I want to compliment particularly the people from the communities who put that effort into developing those comprehensive agreements because sometimes we couldn't get quite total agreement on, uh, on who we are and how we are want to be treated because we had to respond to industry and to government in an understandable way to them. Easy for us, but very difficult for industry and government to look at a new way of doing business under a final land claim agreement. And as a result, this building here is sitting on subsurface Inuvialuit land. So if you want to know what it feels like, that's what you're sitting on right now. <laughs> and um, we'd also like to compliment the contractors because uh, we had a lot of difficulty in the last while to try to find enough work to keep our contractors and our local businesses busy enough so that they would be able to continue because we always had the faith and we always had the belief that the resources were here and it was only a certain period of time before this would be triggered. So we're going to continue to make sure our relationships are, are good and we want to know under the, the obligations we have, we have to make sure that our people are at work and our businesses are working and the fact that we have a good relationship with the people who are coming to the area and who are participating. So I have the full confidence that the right people are in place. Not enough of them, mind you, because we have some very uh, well-trained people like Mervyn Grubin from Grubin's Transport here. I'd like to acknowledge him because part of their crew were ill and, uh, and you're representing it. And, and this was the idea of how you were going to get the camp here. Like uh, Jim was saying, it could have been a brand new camp or it could have been an existing camp. And uh, this, I watched it, uh, the camp, as it came along, and it would have been quite nice for the press to be here when they were offloading all these compartments and, and doing this work. So for something that couldn't be done, we have to compliment the, the workers who put the uh, facility in place because it was done. So I welcome you to uh, the region and to uh, enjoy the um, company of each other there are a lot of people here who have experience, who've been in the oil patch before, and who are sitting among you. And uh, they can answer a lot of detailed questions about what happened before, why it's happening today, and the fact that we would like to build our vision to make sure every person has a place in the new development of the oil and gas industry here. There's one thing that's very different in, in what's going on now. A lot of people had fear of the development of oil. That was the biggest catch we had when we were in the last um, oil and gas uh, activity up here. People were looking for oil. And people were apprehensive because of what happened in Alaska. People had that fear. But with gas, it's, a, it's an easier movement and it's a cleaner product, and people feel that this is not something that would be environmentally damaging. It can be handled, and it's not disruptive. So those, that's a difference that people see between the previous uh, quest for gas and the present quest for, or the previous quest for oil and the present quest for gas. So these are the two, the, the very major difference and the fact that we have a claim and we are going to be involved and will set the stage to be involved and the rules will be clear and understandable 